I'll give you a little bit of background so you know if you're in the right room or not. Um, basically, we're gonna, what you're going to learn about is how, what we call our course production process. So this is really the process for getting a course ready to be launched, and we're talking about our online courses. So how do we check them for quality assurance to make sure all the settings are correct, everything's set the way we want before we open it up for students? And uh, you'll see we've built a very generic tool, so it can be repurposed for a lot of different needs, but uh, it's helpful to understand where we came from. Um, and in building that tool, what I'm hoping to convey is the value of putting data in the hands of the people who need it. Um, and so you're going to learn a bit about that, um, how our tool works, how you can use it yourself if you want to get it. And we'll talk a little bit about the technical, but we're going to kind of not go into that too far. Um, and uh, Maggie uh, and Anne are uh, two course producers with us um, who are experts at helping faculty get their courses ready. Uh, for launch, and both of them have an incredible amount of experience. We have a real super production team, and what my desire was is to not have them waste their time, right? They can add a lot of value uh, for improving the actual content of the course, not just are all the settings set up correctly, and we could easily get buried by that. Um, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about how we do things, but first I want to check how you guys do things, and then Maggie will give an overview of our, our setup. So everyone does this differently. So do you have a process at, at your school for how you get courses ready uh, to launch? Is there some formal process? Raise your hand. Okay. And um, if you don't know what a master course model means, it means you build the course ahead of time, and then you copy it in for the faculty member. And then the next time the course runs, you're going to copy from that master again. The faculty member isn't going to just keep reusing theirs. So you really keep coherence. Uh, how many uh, schools are using a master course model? So we got quite, quite a few, but not many. Um, and are you personally involved in some form of QA process for your courses in Canvas? So raise your hand. So that's a lot of you are wearing that hat. And hopefully we can give you a tool that will save you time. <laughs> so Maggie's going to talk a little bit about our process at Champlain. So to put this tool in context, um, I'm going to describe, just briefly describe our production process. First, we import from the, about seven, six or seven weeks before the course is going to launch, we import from the last time the course ran, not a master copy. So after we import, we do a quick prep, we enroll the instructor, and then we send them a welcome note. Um, the welcome note also has attached to it a checklist that we expect the instructor to go through. Um, when the instructor completes their section, their checklist, it's very short, they send it, they contact us, and then we do the long quality check process. And there are probably about 60 items on this checklist. So the quality check has things like, are the discussions all threaded? Are the links to external websites working? Are the announcements that we require to be pre oh, can you hear me? <laughs> Should I start over? <laughs> no? OK, good. Um, we have lots in this list. The um, quality course uh, checklist has, um, like, are links working? Are the discussions um, set to be threaded? Will, are there um, announcements in there that should be? Are the dates correct? And so on. So this tool has saved us a lot of time with this process. Yeah, so as uh, Maggie just described, right, we have a lot of common things that we're looking for. And these are the little technical details that really can trip you up uh, and take a lot of time to look for. And so we wanted a tool that could do just that. And um, specifically, um, yeah, let me move on to the next slide, because you really covered all that. <laughs> So what we're looking for is a solution that empowers those people who actually are looking at the work. And what uh, the problem I ran into is previously I was writing a number of scripts that would run reports, and then I would get a CSV file, right? And that's the easiest way to write a report. You get a big CSV file. And, and then someone's emailing me every time they need a new version of that. And that's a real pain. That's not a good workflow. I want to empower them to run their own reports. But I need an easy tool to do it. Um, and we didn't know all the ways the tool's going to be used 
before it's built, right? So you want to build something generic. And one of the things I didn't like about a lot of the reports that we had, they were too specific. I wanted something that's very open-ended. Um, it shouldn't require sysadmin support. Uh, the cool thing you'll notice about this is as a faculty <coughs> member, you can run this tool yourself. There's nothing stopping you. No one, you don't have to ask permission from anyone. You just set it up. You'll only be able to analyze your own courses. So it runs with whatever credentials you have in Canvas, and that's the only access you have. Um, the other concept is that it should be read only. And the reason for this is really we're the e-learning department. We're not the sysadmins for Canvas at our institution. And we don't want to take the risk that we're going to break something. So we only ever make read calls on the Canvas back end. Um, so let's uh, look at tool. We actually chose to build the tool in Google Spreadsheets, believe it or not. Uh, there's about 1,500 lines of Google Apps Script on the back end of this. So uh, it's not your typical spreadsheet. But uh, Carl Shafat was our primary programmer of this. Uh, he's a recent graduate who is working for us, um, actually not in a programming capacity. And then we had some extra time. And he had a Java and JavaScript background. And me and him just sat down and uh, started hacking this thing out. And he did an amazing job uh, writing this for us. Uh, really incredible. Uh, Nick Nelson gave a talk at a previous InstructureCon on how you can make calls to the AP, uh, API calls from a Google spreadsheet. We took that as a baseline, and we uh, took his sample code as a baseline and just kind of ran with it. Um, so let me dive into the tool. And if you're wondering how to get it in uh, the Canvas community, there's actually an event for this talk. And in the comment for the event, I've posted a link to this exact spreadsheet. Right? So this is kind of a bare bones one. And you're just going to simply go to it. And you'll have view only access. And then you're going to make a copy. And that's it. Now you have your own copy of it. Um, so what you're going to need to do is set it up. Let me just walk back to the top. And it will walk you through with instructions on how to configure the tool, right? And these, how you can select stuff, how to use it, and how it works. Um, so let me walk into my version of the tool. So when you make a copy, one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to add your credentials. And there's instructions for doing it. Um, those credentials are an API token that you generate in Canvas in the settings, in your personal settings. You don't ever want someone to get that token. That's like the key to the castle. And if you're an admin in Canvas, it really <laughs> is the key to the castle. So this spreadsheet, I don't share with anyone. So Maggie has her own copy. Anne's got her own copy. Anyone has their own copy. If you make a copy, don't share it with your colleague. Make them get their own. <laughs> right? That's the basic rule. So. Just walking across the first sheet here is a selection tab. And if you've set up your accounts um, and term, you can just get a nice pull down list to select the course that you want to analyze. You can also just type in the course ID right here. So that's a nice shortcut. First thing you're going to want to do is pull back the course settings. This is just the primary settings. You can see if it's published. We try to color code it to be nice uh, to read. Um, and the way this works, I'm going to try to run this. The internet's a little flaky. So I'm going to wipe the sheet out. And now if I say repopulate the course sheet, it's going to go to the Canvas back end, and it already yanked all those settings back and populated it. And you'll notice there's a repopulate all sheets, which is going to populate all the tabs at once, which is a nice shortcut. So some of the things you're going to end up looking for Oh, well, let me just walk through each tab in turn. So here's the Assignments tab. It's all the settings on all the assignments. We try to color code it so it's easy to read. The Pages tab, let me move that over again. Uh, all the settings on the pages. Announcements, Discussions, Modules, Folders, keep going, Files. And then there's a couple Settings tabs, right? 
we have a date checker that's going to check if your assignment dates are in the range of the given week. So it's got to know the weeks of the semester. And we tend to define our online courses that way. So if you've populated this out, it can actually check your assignment dates to see if they're in the likely range. Maybe when you copied it from the previous semester, your dates are off. Um, these are the search terms that you could search for. So you can search all the content of your Canvas course for certain search terms, and you can add new ones here. And there's some hidden tabs as well. There's a credentials tab. That's where your Canvas token goes. And there's actually, you notice there's no line two. It's hidden. On line two is where your Canvas credentials go. That's the secret token. Uh, and then there's a further tab called lists. And this you really need to set up the first time. It has the URL for your instance of Canvas, plus a little extra information. So you'll have to type in the name of your Canvas instance, as well as some terms and account codes. And the reason why I hard coded it this way, one, it's faster. But two, you can just deal with the accounts and terms that you care about. You might have so many terms at your university, you don't want to see them all. You can just put the ones you care about. Um, so let's actually look at some of the stuff this can do. Any questions so far before I dive in? All right, so I'm going to dive into what it can do for you. So on the selection tab, obviously, I picked the course, right? And so on the course tab, on our online courses, we tend to weight our assignment groups. So that would stand out right away that this is not a weighted assignment group. Um, if we keep moving over to the Assignments tab, I can scan here and wonder, oh, why did this faculty mute these two assignments before the course launched, but not these other ones, right? I can also look at whether Turnitin is enabled. And notice, if it's a dash, there's no ability to run Turnitin.com on those particular assignment types. But one of them could have been using Turnitin, but didn't. Maybe they want to, right? Um, we tend to have a lot of problems with group assignments not being set up correctly. So <laughs> we really want clear instructions. So we want to flag those, right? Uh, similarly, points versus percentages can be subtle, but it would be nice if they were all the same. And here's one assignment where it's 35 points and all the others are 100 points. Maybe that's a problem that we should look into, right? We can call, keep walking over and see rubrics. Right? Is it using a rubric for grading? I can also check for links and search the course. So what it's going to do is, in he this column here, it's going to look at all the descriptions in the assignments and say, are there any broken links? Here it's going to look for search terms and see if any of those search terms were found in the description. So we moved from the Angel LMS, and in the Angel LMS, it was called turning it into your Dropbox. That's where you turned in assignments. And so we're slowly phasing out that. So we can see that those assignment instructions still refer to the Dropbox. And if I wanted to fix that, I have a nice handy link right over here. And I could pop right into the course. And see, it still says turn it into your Dropbox. Maybe I want to go in and fix that. Sorry, I'm brushing up against things. Um, so we also have a date checker. See how fast this runs? So it'll check the dates. Uh, blue means it's due on the last day of the week. So our uh, uh, weeks tend to start on a Monday and on a Sunday night. So all the blue ones are due on the, on the Sunday night of that week. Yellow means it's due sometime earlier in the week, right? but still during the week that it's assigned. Uh, red means it's either before or after the week in which it's assigned. Now, this only works because we're really systematic. We tend to name all our assignments with the week number or put them in a module, and the module name has the week number. And so that's how our script can actually find that out. OK. Any questions on the assignments one? Yeah. Yes. Ye yes. <laughs> so let's do that again. So on the pages, right, we got a little bit more lecture content. Um, oh, 
it lost that. Huh, I guess I'm going to have to rerun it. So one place we found this very useful is if a course changes names, we can do a search for the, the name change of the course. It's usually on content pages or assignments or so on. Oh, this actually does have it. Yeah. Did I fix one? Oh, there it is. Um, so like here is a broken Vimeo link, it looks like. So let's go and look at that lecture. And there it is. Oops, broken Vimeo link, right? <laughs> so it can really hone you in really fast to find broken links. Make sense? It does um, occasionally give false positives. So there's a 404, which is a definite error. There's a zero code, which might just mean a timeout or something weird. We return those anyhow. And the same with the mail to links. We return those. And a lot of times, those aren't problems. Um, but we just flag them. You learn what to ignore. Um, actually, I believe, I can't remember if it still does it. Yeah. So if you. If you click on it, there's more information. It tells you this was a 404 error code. It puts the error code in the parentheses. OK. Um, any questions so far? Yeah. Does it check links to, to internal files and in modules, things like that, or just on pages? So it, will, it only is checking external stuff. So it can't search through a PDF doc. We started to write uh, where if you had an HTML file in the file section, it would search through that HTML file. Um, I, I can't promise that it works reliably because we don't have many of those. But if you notice in the file section, there is a broken links. It will check them. It's looking for HTML files and should be going through. I can't remember if that code is totally finished. Um, and then likewise, if you go to the course tab, the syllabus is on the course tab down here, and I can check for broken links in the syllabus that way. And I don't think there are, well, we'll find out. Yeah, I, don't know. <laughs> I can't remember. Um, so let me uh, come back a little bit. Let's see if I can move to real questions. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. I can dive in a number of different directions from here, depending on where people are interested in seeing this go. Um, so I think I'm just going to open it up to questions, and we'll see what comes out of that. I just want to backtrack just a bit to find out the form. It came from something in the Canvas community? The, <laughs> Oh, so this the Google spreadsheet, yeah. I posted it on the Canvas community. There's, there's an event for every single conference workshop. So there's an event for this workshop. And you can go there, and I have a link to it. I've got it. Thank you. Yep. I don't have a question. I just have to say, the three years I've been to InstructorCon, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Good to <hear. laughs> Oh, no. It'll, if you put in your course code and you say repopulate all, it will repopulate everything. Yep. Um, I'll come back in. There is a, so you put your course code here, and then on the repopulate menu, you just say repopulate all sheets, and it does that based on whatever course code you put in. Right. We're actually not having any faculty currently who use this, but I'm open to the idea. So we built a tool that was flexible enough for that. We did find we have another department that does some quality assurance, and they found some creative uses for this tool that we wouldn't have thought of. And they're also using it. And what are those creative uses? Um, so they do things like looking at uh, how many submissions aren't still graded in a course, right? Things like that. One other useful um, item. This, earlier today, I was having a conversation with somebody, and they wanted to know what's been changed at the end of a course. And you can run it at the end of the course, too, to see what pages have been changed. Yeah. So a handy way to do that, one, when you copy a course, it blanks out who was the author of each page. So here we can quickly see who edited it last 
each of the pages. And if I come back and I can also see the last update date and see that it's past the created date. And one nice thing about this tool, because it's just built on spreadsheets, if you don't care about a column, you can hide it. Or if you want to do some conditional formatting and maybe uh, color code or run some other analysis, it's just a spreadsheet. Yep. Um, where do you input the search terms that you want to search for? Yep. There's a search tab. So you just make a list. Awesome. I have another question. Um, is, would there be any way to use this if you wanted to search? Uh, for instance, I was thinking about when we set up the specifications for our proctored exams, we double check those to make sure they're correct, but we do a bunch of courses at one time. <clears throat> would there be any way to use this so it could pull the information from one area of multiple courses at the same time? No, not currently. You'd have to add that feature. Okay. So um, we really built this to get it into the power user hand, um, but not as a back-end admin tool. So you might find it's easier to write reports for that. And we also tend not to use many quizzes in our online courses, pretty much none. So if you notice, there is no additional information on quizzes other than they're an assignment, because it's just not that important to us. Yes? Right, so kind of. It can speed up your process, but it's not going to totally automate it. Um, so the Pages tab gives you the most information from the API, but even on assignments, you can see the last update of the assignment, right? So you know when you copied it, and you can see this one assignment here was modified after all of the others. So I know that was modified after it was copied. Does that make sense? Well, you, you can go into the code and add it. <laughs> yeah, that's the short answer. <laughs> yep. Does it by any chance check when an assignment was added or a discussion was added? Uh, yeah, so here you have the last update on it. So if that's enough information for you, um, I think for assignments, the only thing the Canvas backend gives you is the last update. For pages, you have more information. Thanks. Yep. Does it check what's been deleted in the course? Nope. So it's pretty simple and bare bones. We're, uh, we're not getting too fancy here. Um, it's it's kind of just raw what you can get back via the API. Um, and we found we just got a lot of power from that basicness of it. Um, if you're curious on how to extend it, the code looks long and complicated. I don't find it too bad. Um, I've been able to add a couple features here or there. Um, and uh, Carl is a little squiggly with his code, but it's, it's actually pretty solid. And we find this thing's very reliable, it's, um, and it's well commented throughout. One trick um, we've needed to play, um, let me go to a different one. Announcements might work. Yeah, so on the right-hand side, you see the broken links, and they're in gray. Um, Google Apps script will time out after five minutes. So you cannot run a script that takes longer than five minutes. And when we had courses with huge numbers of pages, and those pages had tons of links that had to be checked, it took more than five minutes sometimes. So what it does is, as it's checking for broken links, it's changing the color of these, right, as it goes down and removing the dash. And that way, if it times out, you just rerun it, and it picks up where it left off. Um, so it's low tech, but it works well. <laughs> so are the gray ones the ones it hasn't gotten to? Or the yes, it wasn't, has not gotten to. Thank you. So I haven't run it on this one. And you can see if we ran the link checker, 
it would just go down the list. And it should color code them. That's the checksum. Yeah, we didn't include the link checking with populating the whole thing because once again, we'd be over our five minute limit. Sure, it's, um, it's, it's pretty easy in here to go to tools, script editor, and that loads up all your macros, so that's all the code. It's a nice little header. It's JavaScript. If you, if you know JavaScript, that's all it is. It's called Google Apps Script, but it's 95% of JavaScript. Um, so coming through, um, we tried to get the settings out of global variables. Um, so it, yeah, I mean, it's like anything with code. It's going to be a little nasty if you haven't seen JavaScript before. But there's nicely commented, it's really not too bad if you're a JavaScript programmer. And uh, I know Canvas, for instance, I mean, Structure, they made some change three weeks ago, uh, last week. That was the, where they changed the headers in, that are returned by the API calls for the link to the next page. And that, of course, broke this. And I totally panicked. And it turned out all they did was change a capital L to a, in link to a lowercase l in link. <laughs> so it works now. <laughs> so if, if we go out to the community and we grab this and we start running it and it breaks because the ne next update does something, is there a way you're good, are you, would you continue to maybe update and say, hey, there, here's a new version that's fixed? Or I don't get, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't guarantee it, but we might. So, because we're going to want it for ourselves and we'll probably copy it in, but I don't really want to be on the hook to say this is something we're maintaining because uh, we are just giving it out to the community. Um, but what I like about it is it's not something you've attached to Canvas. You're not truly dependent on it. It's, it, you know, it's not like an LTI or something like that. Yes, in the back. I, I think this is the first time they've seen it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, yep. I do have some things I would love to do in a dream world, but if if you want to know the truth, we don't. I'm my hat that I wear is not a programmer hat. I'm an administrator. We don't have any programmers anymore. Unfortunately, Carl's moved on, um, and so and Carl. Um, you know, we, we don't have any full-time web programmer on our team to do stuff like this. I know Utah State really has someone. So we've been creative with low-tech tools and take them as far as we can. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.